In this video, I'm breaking down Airbag, which is the first track from Radiohead's OK Computer, arguably one of the best albums of all time, of any genre, and certainly one of my top favorites. I've loved this album since I was a preteen. I remember listening to it and just thinking like, well, this is different. Basically, I felt like I'd gone through something when I listened to it. It was so nuanced. You know, it didn't make me want to dance. It didn't make me want to cry. It didn't make me angry. It didn't make me happy either. It just, it was so complex. I just really enjoy the process of figuring out what's going on with the harmonies and the melodies and the rhythms and the production elements that all culminates in me feeling the way I do when I listen to music. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Just a really quick disclaimer. I don't really do lyric analysis. I just don't really know what I'm doing in that area. Uh, but I might connect some of the lyrics to what I'm hearing musically. I'm gonna be using some music theory terms as just a language to describe some of these concepts. But that doesn't mean that they were writing the music with all those things in mind. In fact, it's unlikely that they were, that it was more of an intuitive and emotional process. What an incredible opening to an album. I mean, their openings are always great, but this one is so distinctive and memorable. So this low melody is played by both an electric guitar and a cello sample on the Mellotron. And they're playing in unison, so they're in the exact same octave. But they use panning to kind of separate them. But it's still cool. I feel like our brain sort of invents like a third instrument that sounds like both of them at the same time. So already it's different. And the actual melody itself has some unusual things going on. It's navigating something called mode mixture. There's both major and minor key things happening in here. At first it's like A minor. Then it goes major. Back to minor, back to major, back to minor, major, minor. The main sort of uh, conflict that's created in this melody is that we have both the major third and the minor third. And then this F, okay, this F is called a flat six. Six. This is a heavy, powerful, potent note that's going to carry a lot of the haunting and sort of troubled qualities that come later in the song. Keeping time is the sleigh bell, which is literally, look, it's just a bunch of sleigh bells on a stick. And I think I even hear like a really subtle acoustic guitar kind of playing some syncopated notes, which then I think sort of develops into Tom playing an A power chord. Listen to how Tom's A power chord is interacting with the low, gritty guitar slash cello riff. It's so beautiful. We're gonna talk about the chord later because it's so good. <laughs> and then 
then this cleaner sounding guitar comes in doing. Which is like straight out of an A major scale. So it's got a lot of warmth and kind of positivity to it. It also sounds a little bit innocent to me and almost a little bit vulnerable. So this line has some clashing with the gritty kind of mm, almost menacing uh, guitar slash cello riff. Okay, so I think you get the point. Listen, listen to some of this clash. Right here, this already sounds a little bit discordant. It's a bit uncertain. And I think it's because this is the flat six note, which comes from minor land, and this is the major third, which comes from major land. So they just usually aren't in the same place at the same time. So I love that sound. But then there's like a really direct clash up here. Um, so I just collapse them right next to each other. Now you can hear like they are very much at odds. A C and a C sharp. But I love that they just let it, they just let the melody like run over whatever was going on with that lick. They didn't try to make them get along, so to speak. You got a lot of nice repetition. And the way that this little figure repeats lines up with the rhythm of the lower melody, which is... Okay, quick diversion to the drums. They nailed it with the drums in this song, and we get to hear them really nicely exposed at the very beginning in the intro. The groove has a, sort of this extra snare hit. Usually snares hit on two and four, so usually what you clap to in a song, okay? But this one has a... Uh, 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 uh. So this creates a little bit of a feeling of syncopation. Syncopation will save the nation. Syncopation is what gives music, I think, the feeling of humanity. It's more organic. It's more offbeat. It sounds like they sampled the drums and then they ran them through a bunch of filters and then overlaid more tracks of drums on top of the session drums so that there's like glitching going on, right? There's that feeling of technology sort of overtaking the acoustic, you know, the real, the raw feeling. And, you know, from what I've read, this album is very much about sort of fear of technology or just how technology is affecting humanity. They kind of come in and out at, again, sort of random unexpected intervals. So this keeps, all these things keep our ear very engaged. Nigel Godrich produced this album and then has produced every Radiohead album after this. And I can see why, because the band plus Nigel just, I think it's meant to be. Also, listen to how Phil comes in with the fill. Whenever drums first enter a song with a fill, it kind of feels like it's like like I'm like I'm getting ready, like I don't know, like a running start or something. This melody and the drums and so many other elements in this song, they sort of enter when you don't expect. So we get like an extra measure. Again, usually things are in multiples of four. It just gives a feeling of like a run-on sentence a bit. So the eighth measure is this beautiful chord that rings out. And that, my friends, is just one of the most beautiful chords known to humankind. I think it's one of my favorites. And I've learned it's called an add nine chord. So there's an extra note in there. That's what's added. And it's the one that's creating this kind of delicious, lush, clash that one and that one's like particularly loud and it rings out wow 
you just play a major chord and then you go a whole step up from the root of the chord. So if you're playing an A major chord, go a whole step up from the A, get B, and you play a B on top of it all. And you can arrange this lots of ways like this. Uh, on the piano at least. I don't know how it works on guitar. Ending with the phrase, I am born again at the end. Same melody, same line. That's the only line I could reliably make out, you know, in the first verse when I was a kid. The rest I just kind of... When he sings, I am born again, it sets off an extra two measures that kind of mimics that feeling we got at the end of the intro. This beautiful melody comes in, which is, I think, a clear variation or callback to the but it's just kind of a instead of the verse being riff-based, like the intro, this is more chord-based. You get an A chord first, I think it's just a power chord, but you could also play it with the major third in the next. Then we get this. You can probably hear that there's a lot of clash. That's a big clash. It's called a minor second. It's a really, really uh, disruptive sound. It's beautiful. And to me, that kind of implies this chord. That chord. It feels sort of like a tense bridge to the next chord, which I think is basically a D chord. You could think of it as an A sus4, but to me it sounds like D. Scrolling up and down, but just voice like that. On I am born again, it comes back to that beautiful homey A major chord with the It's so comforting. But now I want to talk about the bass. Collins' sparse, sort of interjecting, repetitive but unpredictable bass line is one of my favorite things about this song. The bass usually supports the bottom floor, <laughs> if you think of the song as a house. You know, it's the foundation, I think. He just comes in to remind you that there is a floor. So there's this feeling of floating, of being detached, you know, separated from reality, maybe raising up out of your seat in a car that's flipping. I don't know. It's just this really interesting sensation. And the bass line will often in popular music sort of legitimize or support the root of a chord. So like an A chord has an A on the bottom. And then all the notes are sort of built on top of it. So if I want to play A major chord and I want to play a bass note that feels really satisfying, I would play an A. If I want to play a bass note that feels kind of like it's transitory, I might play C sharp, which is the next note in the chord. But C doesn't feel nearly as like satisfying or settled, or even there's like this need for movement there. Anyway, not only is it just kind of coming in and out at what feels like sort of random intervals, but it's also playing the same figure regardless of how the chords might feel like they're kind of shifting around. Sometimes he goes, duh, duh. It works. Another little bluesy lick there that he brings in. I wrote in my notes, I like the part where it goes, do, 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 do. Wait. 
Before we get to Tom's melody, let's talk about this synth. I thought it was um, the Onde Martineau. I say that right? I had trouble confirming this, but it sounds like Johnny used a prophecy synth for this record and then later switched to the Onde Martineau. There's a really great video about how Johnny Greenwood saved this instrument from, you know, extinction, basically. So if you want to Martineau more about it, <laughs> I forgot to warn you guys that are new. I make puns. Anyway, the Onde Martineau is like a type of theremin, and it sounds very otherworldly and voice-like, but so does this synth. So I, when growing up, I, th I thought this was Tom. I thought Tom was singing in his beautiful falsetto. Some people think it's a soprano singer. What did you think it was? So it goes, ooh, That's so pretty. Everything's all together, and then it kind of slides into dissonance all together. When it goes up there, it's really pretty because... It makes that chord so completely major, and it's just so beautiful. Next one. And then Jack Nap Okay, now let's take a look at Tom's vocal melody and his phrasing. In the next world war. Already something happening here that I always I don't know, just kind of stood out to me, is if he sang in the chord, he'd go, in the next, in the next. But he sings, in the next, in, 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 in. I kind of like this. It just sounds pleasant and carefree. In the next, which is really interesting to hear with, in the next world war as the lyric. I find a lot of the time there's like a conflict between the way the music sounds and what Tom is saying. You know, you listen to a Radiohead song and you're like, this song sounds so happy, but why do I feel so sad? You know, his phrasing is very like kind of fits and bursts. Also kind of unpredictable and very organic sounding. I don't know how I would like notate that, in other words. How I would put that into a grid. Don't ever put Tom York in a grid. And then that positive, I am born again, it sounds so confident. And one of the reasons is because it ends on the tonal center. That's A. So it just feels so complete. I am born again, little suspension there. Mm -hmm. And then the da 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 just kind of just feels so like a hug. In a neon sign scrolling up and down, I am born again. And then this leads us into the chorus, which is actually really short. It's only six measures long, total. That's also unusual. I love that whatever their background was as a group and individually, if they learned rules, right, for how like a song should go, they're ignoring them. In an interstellar burst, I'm back to save the universe. One of the greatest lines. I love the harmony in the chorus because it has this one chord that's kind of surprising. Why is this chord surprising? Well, it doesn't exist in the key of A major or A minor. This comes from Lydian, which is a different scale, which has a very open, almost like ultra major sound. I just leave the sustain pedal on, it's like a dream. Shit. Pretty. This part 
changes to an F sharp minor chord. This is the first and only minor chord in the whole song. In an burst, that note. You get that feeling of like pushing the tension to release it. And then I'm back to save this part. It kind of gets that feeling of what's called the sus4. It's a suspension. You hear this a lot in like church music. It's very warm and kind of reverent sounding. So that's kind of how that whole chorus ends. And he ends singing on the tonal center again. So I'm back to say the universe. I think that's synth that we talked about before is holding out this A the entire time, kind of grounding us up here. and then it all comes together. The defining sound of the second verse for me is the tremolo picked guitar melody. actually kind of fades in from the end of the interlude. So there's like this bridge between them that's so beautiful, kind of blossoms open. Drowned in reverb and delay, it's holding out an A. And then this line is just crazy beautiful and very haunting, I think. This is a line that, when I was younger, felt a bit troubled to me. Like there's a bit of pain in this. The note that's doing that in my opinion, is that flat six note, which is F in this key. But it's in a line that sounds mostly from major. So again, mode mixture. Two things about this I really like. The da, 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 da. That's a flat six note coming in. In fact, we heard the regular six, not the flattened one, which comes from major first. Da, da, da. Then, da, da. see it's lower. I think is like the painful version of I love this. I love the way it's articulated. The da, 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 like doubling of the of the note. You got the major third, which brings all those feelings of major keys and warmth and confidence and peace and you know, with the flat six, which comes from minor. So that's the. Just to give you an example, I'm gonna play it like it was all major. Now, if it was all minor. It sounds very uh, serious and severe. It sounds so pretty when he sings, I'm amazed that I survived, that little, uh, but it's on the minor four chord. 
I'm amazed that I, amazed that I survived. And there's all this delicious tension in there. So the bridge is next, and the bridge is an extension, I think, of the second verse. Tremolo guitar gets a chance to really spread its wings even more, kind of wail. Forgot to mention, you know, you've got the tremolo picked guitar on the right. On the left, there's just a distorted electric guitar that's just kind of playing the notes more sustained. The two guitars kind of split off from being in unison with each other. And they play their two different variations, and it feels like they're both kind of hitting that peak, which is the C. It's the highest note. It's from the minor scale, so it has some weight to it. And they, they kind of hit it at different times, and there's just sort of this cascade of, like, wailing and crying out. It's so incredible. <laughs> So beautiful. If you've always loved that, I think it's because it's doing this thing Radiohead does a lot where they mix a major sounding song with a minor four chord. Sorry. So. It's just very wistful, I think. You can hear maybe the intro to Nude right now, right? Ooh. Mixing these sounds creates nuance, and Radiohead does this all the time. They loop something twice that sort of extends the chorus to be a little bit longer. And the way they do that is kind of neat because at the end of the first phrase, universe, he doesn't sing you, uh, universe like he always does. He goes universe. And can you hear different notes? And it's no longer resting on the tonal center, that A anymore. It's higher. So it kind of prompts him to like go again. Universe and interstellar burst. I'm back to save the universe. The bass line starts to interject a lot more. And so it kind of feels like it's starting to build because, you know, the bass line has a lot of energy behind it, right? It's loud, it's full, it's deep, it's foundational. But instead, the song just kind of breaks down. the guitars starting to kind of, like I said, break down. It feels like they've kind of lost their grip. Interjections, you know, very conversational. It actually reminds me of like fireworks or sparks or just little explosions. The bass takes the lead now with the sleigh bells keeping time. So the bass starts to go like this. Then... And then listen, he starts to kind of amp things up even more. It starts playing more and more and more. And now he's playing almost constantly. It feels like like he was playing like a long game. Tom at the end. Uh, very harmonious and it reminds me of da -da 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 -da, everything that goes da -da 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 -da, all of those melodies that kind of end on that major third. It's just a nice memory. The riff from the very beginning comes back and something really cool happens with this riff and the bass. The bass actually joins in with some of the riff. And then it kind of does like But it hits the flat six and the minor third, and it just feels like it's finally 
supporting everything. And that's, I think, why the end, a lot of reasons, but I think that's part of why the end feels so full. So this builds and builds and builds and it feels like you're just like going through this tunnel and you'd have no idea when you're gonna get to the light. When are you gonna get to the other side? Just feels endless and all of a sudden you come out with this like shimmery, golden, beautiful cord. It feels so bright, so like life affirming and it just couldn't be a better ending. Thank you for watching this whole video. I know it was a long one. I really, really appreciate it. And if you liked it, please subscribe. Please like it. Please comment, share. It helps me so much. And also this way you won't miss any more uploads when I do the rest of the album. I want to thank all my patrons for supporting me in making these videos. And special thanks to Chris Egert, Ed Hagopian, Bob S., Kai Canyon Ellis, Mahela Crosignani, Peter Viden, Christopher Mitchell, Brian Hook, Joseph Antuono, Vesuvian, Jolt Turuk, Dan Kelly, Guy Villiers, John Kirkulis, Kieran Yoner, and Eric W1 for being my top supporters. As well as Son of a Gun, Rondon Tony, and Siu 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 for being so incredibly generous this month with donations and purchases on Bandcamp. Okay, that's it. Happy New Year. Have a great one, and I will see you next time. Oh no. Eyelash in my. Oh no. If you're still watching, I reserve three hours for a live stream at the end of every month for anyone that's on my Patreon where they can request a song, and I often am able to get to all of them. I have a few openings at the time, at least of recording this video, for one-on-one -on -one sessions with me monthly, and I also am starting a new bi-weekly, hour-and-a-half-long Zoop, Zoop? <laughs> group for those of my patrons that are at the $20 educational tier and up where you can talk to other songwriters and producers, including myself, on Zoom uh, every other week, basically, for an hour and a half. We're going to meet. We're going to just talk about our music, share what we're working on, get feedback and accountability and support.